Okay, so we're about to begin our uh, interview with uh, George Demopoulos. Uh, the interviewer, as usual, will be William McRae, and we are currently at the uh, uh, McGill campus in Montreal, um, and it is uh, November 12, 2015. So uh, let's begin. So just to start off, could you please state your full name? George Demopoulos. And where were you born? In Athens, Greece. Okay. 1951, some time ago. Which would make you which age? 64, I guess. 64. And as a child, what did your parents do? Uh, basically farmers, uh, although my, my father uh, worked for the railway uh, company, um, you know, as a public servant, but uh, in, in a village, and at the same time he was uh, a farmer. Okay. And uh, as a child, what did you do uh, in Athens to, to pass time? Uh, no, I, I, I was born in Athens, but I grew up in a village. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, just simply the, my birthplace is okay, the hospital okay. was in Athens. Yes. But otherwise, uh, I grew up in a village about uh, 130 kilometers southwest of Athens uh, by the sea. Uh, so, you know, I, I went to elementary school there and uh, nearby high school in a town uh, about 10 kilometers from the village. I grew up until uh, the age of 18 when I moved to Athens to pursue my university studies. Okay. And, and as a child, what, uh, what were your pastimes? What were your go-to activities? Uh, just get together with uh, other boys in the neighborhood playing soccer and uh, uh, swimming during the summer, uh, right. fishing, uh, because we, you know the our houses were uh, by the, by the sea. Uh, yeah, things like that. No TV, no video yeah. games. <laughs> yeah. yeah, imagination. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot. Uh, imagination. Uh, but something that was very important in my upbringing is that uh, my father, uh, my parents also run uh, a small. Uh, general store and, and, and coffee shop and uh, you know the the elders of the village will come and have their coffee and play cards so i will listen to stories uh, from them okay. but the other thing is that uh, we had to buy a newspaper every day for our clientele and that newspaper became my uh, window to the world so i developed an interest about world things like i remember uh, even uh, the death of Marilyn Monroe, you yeah. know, or uh, you know, uh, the, the assassination of the President Kennedy, yeah. uh, when uh, other, you know, kids of my age didn't know, what, or the political situation in Greece, and uh, or or in Africa, I remember the liberation movement about uh, all the new African countries that uh, were born uh, after the colonial rule. So all, that was through a newspaper that was arriving every morning. Uh, that uh, opened uh, my eyes about uh, the world. So at a young age you were kind of into journalism? Uh, not, journal, ju not journalism, just I, I was thirsty to learn about what was happening, world. you know, beyond my mm -hmm. immediate uh, neighborhood and uh, group of people that uh, mm -hmm. I was living with. Which can be quite isolated. Uh, in rural yeah, yeah, it was now. isolated. I mean, uh, it was a big event to go uh, you know, 10 kilometers to, to the town, um, you, you will not go unless there was a, a reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, bicycles were the, the favorite uh, means of transportation, so, you, you know, two, three kilometers uh, distance from the house and back. That was, and I remember a um, little boy, I mean, uh, looking about 10 kilometers horizon, and I thought that, that was another country. That was the end of Greece, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so y you have such a uh, um, limited uh, idea of the world. But anyway, as I was growing up and I was 10 years old, I, you know, that newspaper uh, became really the, what, what opened my eyes. Yeah, the gateway. The gateway, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so tell me about uh, Athens. So you went to Athens when you were 18, uh, 18 to pursue yeah. uh, uh, education? Yeah. Uh, exactly, yeah, I, I, um, in Greece there are um, national-wide uh, um, entrance exams to get to university, um, so I, I wrote those exams, but I had to prepare uh, with some tutorials and so on, so I went to Athens, 
uh, for one year and then I, I was admitted to the National Technical University of Athens. That was the School of uh, Mining and Metallurgical Engineering. That happened in uh, 1970. Uh, and uh, I was for five years. It was a five years program. It follows the German Central European system. Engineering takes five years. Now with the European uh, um, Union, things have changed and this is the equivalent to the master's program. So, yeah, I spent five years, 1970-75, in the Polytechnic School of Athens. Any, um, any specific classes that you remember loving or at least being good at? To be honest with you, uh, the first two years were not very, I was not paying that much attention to classes. I was just happy that I got into the university. I was a village boy, you know, moving to a big city, so many things. Um, so I was not paying that much attention. Um, but uh, really, end, end of second year, third year, the, the last three years, I, I, I the, the subject about metallurgy okay. attracted me more attention. I had uh, um, uh, more interest in chemical things, the chemistry side of things. So the, uh, you know, the, the processing of metals, the extraction of metals from minerals, and then making uh, alloys like steel, you know, learning about this unique, uh, the, the moment you add a little bit of carbon in iron, you, you know, the properties change and you have different grades of steel and steel is so important in, in modern society. Uh, that, that was, uh, and we had a good professor who was um, explaining um, th th those basics. I mean, th th there were you know, more than one professor. Um, and uh, so the metallurgical side attracted me more, uh, but still, you know, not really uh, having yet uh, settled into what exactly I want to do. Mm -hmm. Just I, I, I knew that I want to work more on the metallurgy side of things as opposed to mining. I spent two summers working in an underground mine. Oh yeah? How's uh, that? Oh, because he was a mining and metallurgical engineer, right? So we, we had uh, courses in mining, we had courses in metallurgy, so we had uh, practical exercises. Yeah. You had to go... Uh, Co-op work. Co yeah. li like co-op, mm -hmm. they were obligatory, um, and, and they were, you know, you, you learn to, to deal with people, working with regular blue-collar workers, uh, or the engineers, and, and you see the profession in action, and uh, that was a, no matter the technical side of things, just that aspect of the social interaction with fellow workers, um, more senior or uh, uh, labor, etc. This this is great uh, opportunity to learn as a young person. Mm -hmm. How was uh, working in the mines? How was it? How was it? Any? Did you did you like it, or that's when you really realized <laughs> metallurgy is more my thing? Um, no, I, I I didn't mind working uh, in the mine. It was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, I mean, I was young and so on. Uh, I remember helping uh, people with the, the support of the tunnels. Uh, yeah, but I remember I had long hair, not <laughs> like right now, and I, the workers always would joke with me, go and uh, cut your hair, etc. But I'm glad that, you know, I, I had long hair and I enjoyed back then because now yeah. I don't have any. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it, it was not, um, uh, nearby at the mine there was a mineral processing uh, plant, a flotation plant. In flotation, we use chemicals to separate one mineral from the other. So, although it was not part of my, uh, I was working in the underground mine, but I would go and, and watch what was uh, happening. And, and, and that, uh, the chemicals, you know, even the smell of the chemicals attracted me more. So, gradually, you know, I shifted into the metallurgical mineral processing beyond extractive metallurgy, what we call in, uh, in our field. Okay. So, uh, so after school, what uh, what would you consider to be your first job? Yeah. Okay. So, um, 
About uh, a year before I graduate, uh, summer 1974, um, I saw that there is this program EIST, which still exists, but it's not that well known in North America, but uh, definitely it's, uh, it works in, 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 in Europe, where students can find jobs to work in another country during the summer, typically, okay. like a co-op or internship. So I applied and I was uh, uh, chosen to go for a job in England. That was my first trip outside now, uh, Greece. Uh, so summer uh, 1974, I ended up in, uh, in a suburb of Birmingham, Walsall, where there was the El Elkington Copper Refiners. That was, uh, Elkington was um, the first uh, to, to develop copper refining using electrochemistry. Uh, and I enjoyed it very much. Uh, that was really my brainwash to become a metallurgist. I, I loved so much the whole aspect uh, of uh, it was uh, basically secondary copper that was uh, fire refined and then electro refined. So I would go into the plant, take samples, go into the analytical lab. Uh, I remember my hard time with English. It was the you know, uh, I started learning English late, and perhaps I never master English even now. But uh, the bottom line is that, um, again, I found a, a job there, a working environment, the metallurgical plant, that gave me so much uh, interest to work. Um, so I go back to Greece after the summer experience. So I said, hmm, maybe uh, it's not enough, you know, just to, to get my first degree in engineering. I want to do some research. I want to, to get a master's degree. Uh, and um, with another friend, uh, fellow student, we applied and we got uh, to, to different universities in North America. And McGill was nice, <laughs> kind. Thank you, McGill. <laughs> and uh, we got a scholarship. I got a scholarship and I came to do my master's here. Yeah. And because so I felt um, staying in Greece was for me to go to serve my, my military uh, duty, you know, mm -hmm. because it's obligatory. It's, uh, I, you know, it one year? Or back then it was uh, two years two. and a half. It oh, was, well, 30 two months. Months. was 30 months back then. Now it's one year. Uh, and, um, but, but simply I, I felt that the, the, the first degree didn't satisfy my educational thirst, you know. So I needed to learn a bit more. So I said, well, I'll go for a, for a year, year and a half to do my master's and come back. And that's uh, how that's it history. started now, she, uh, you know, my life on, on the other side of the, <laughs> of the, the ocean. ocean. Yeah, so, right. so talk to me about your, your first uh, experience with, with Canada, with Montreal, with McGill. Yeah, so I arrived 40 years ago. Wow. Exactly 40 years Today? ago. Uh, no, okay. no, that was <laughs> September 13, 1975. I arrived um, at the airport and um, I came to McGill, to this department. It was mining and metallurgical engineer. We we're housed in another building where mining is right now. Um, there, there, there were a, f a couple of friends uh, that were together in Greece that were waiting for me. Uh, we shared the same apartment. Uh, it was a very modest uh, scholarship, uh, something like a couple of thousand dollars to live for the whole year, okay. but enough, you know, to start um, my studies, to, to support my studies and uh, start my career here. Um, and, you know, I registered, I had a supervisor, Professor Distin. He was a hydrometallurgist. And so Professor Williams, who was the chairman of the department, he said, you go to work with this professor, you, you get a scholarship to work with that professor. So um, I started for a couple of months. Uh, I said, hydrometallurgy, hmm. I don't know, I want to work with steel making, you know, st like I said before, steel was mu much more magical as, as, as a material, as an alloy, etc. And I go to see Professor Williams said, uh, can I change supervisor, change project, please? He said, yes, you can change project, but the scholarship does not follow you. Okay. <laughs> you are on your own if you change project. So I said, no, 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 it's fine. <laughs> no, and, and I have all my respect and uh, I'm, I'm thankful to Professor Distin as supervisor 
how patient was with me, you know, coming from another country and so on, supported me. So I, I did my master's and hydrometallurgy became mon métier uh, mm -hmm. d'expertise. I became an expert in hydrometallurgy and uh, really I loved the... Uh, the whole uh, thing to the extent that, you know, still I'm teaching hydrometallurgy yeah. 40 years after. Although at the beginning, you know, I had uh, my doubts and, uh, and I'm very thankful to Professor Williams who insisted, no, George, you do this project or no project for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, hydrometallurgy, you had mentioned in the beginning you loved how the, the fact that you can add, you know, one chemical compound or one element and it can change I mean, that's a lot of hydrometallurgy, yeah, if I'm not yeah. mistaken, so. But uh, I, I was thinking at that point about returning to Greece, mm -hmm. and uh, the industry, the metallurgical industry in Greece was more pyrometallurgical, okay. high temperature furnaces, uh, steel making. So I said, oh, I have job opportunities for hydrometallurgy in Greece. So I had that narrow view. Of always th coming back. Yeah, which kind of uh, uh, influenced a little bit my early thought. By that, uh, after, you know, starting working and enjoying and learning that uh, uh, part of metallurgical engineering, I liked so much that yeah. I never separated from it. So what, uh, were there any drastic difference you noticed with uh, the Canadian university versus a Greek university or, or even in the metallurgy departments? Uh, oh, were there things that they did fundamentally different? Big difference. Uh, the Greek university w was very traditional. The, 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 the professor was uh, um, inaccessible. He had uh, his um, uh, circle of uh, assistants. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and they were, they were very strict and so on. Here I was shocked with how accessible the professors are, like, you know, having coffee with your supervisor and calling first name your supervisor. Uh, it took me quite some time to be able to do that, although my Canadian fellow students were doing this with their supervisors. So it was that openness, that uh, accessibility, you know, this encouragement, you know, I, you know, the, the chairman of the department stopping me in the corridors and asking me, oh, George, how is it going? I, and also I remember seeing, uh, yeah, um, I, mean, I mean, the chairman of the department that was uh, no way that you can, as a simple student, go and, and talk to him in, in Greece, that he was so accessible. That, that uh, really made a big um, impression on me. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, you know, I, it, it was more about uh, getting support to learn, to do better. Like uh, uh, Professor Williams suggested uh, me and uh, a couple of other uh, fellow students uh, to, he gave us support to travel all the way to Vancouver in 1977 to attend the Conference of Metallurgists there. Wow. And that was uh, a discovery trip for me because we drove, four of us, all the way from Montreal to Vancouver wow. and back and in, in, in between discovering the country, uh, you know, camping, all these things that were new for me. Uh, but it was that professor, Professor Williams, you know, the chairman, who took a personal interest. He said, you know, you, you rent a car, you guys, uh, and uh, of course, you know, we had a very simple, uh, uh, I mean, we didn't stay in hotels, etc. But uh, that support, so that was the environment, really, that was so different, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to where I came from. Not that I didn't get support in Greece, don't take me wrong. Uh, simply, it was much more austere, much more traditional uh, system and, uh, than, than what I found here. Yeah. So did you ever, did you go after your, this was your master's mm -hmm. at McGill, uh, did you ever go into industry or did you stay more in the academic? I stayed um, all the okay. way academic. Was so there a reason for that or? The reason, I liked research, okay. doing research. Uh, but there also was a little bit of, um, you know, I had good time as a graduate student. That was the, the best time. I don't want to go 
to move into, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, to start some kind of uh, serious commitment. Um, so, you know, being a graduate student still was, there was, it was a commitment. You had to do your research, etc., write a thesis at the end of the day, but it was not like working uh, uh, in industry and so on. So, b but I liked research, so I was offered uh, a scholarship for, to do my PhD, and I continued with Professor Distin here at McGill. Um, what was your thesis? About, my, my, my first thesis, my master's thesis was about uh, leaching of uh, copper sulfide and uh, minerals. A subject that is still uh, relevant uh, today, it's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, there's a lot of hydrometallurgical process development for chalcopyrite, uh, and, and still we haven't mastered that. Uh, I learned a lot about that, and I'm, I'm proud that the external uh, examiner of my master's thesis was uh, Professor Birkin of Imperial College, one of the uh, modern fathers of hydrometallurgy. He, he had written a textbook, uh, which I had the opportunity to to read, and, I, and it opened my eyes a lot about the chemistry of the hydrometallurgical mm -hmm. processes. And then for my PhD, I work on solvent extraction of metals, you know, using organic solvents to separate, again, copper from other metals. And um, um, the, yeah, I don't remember now. Yeah, I, th I think it was Professor Habasi, the external examiner, yeah, right. of, of, my, of my PhD thesis. So solvent extraction, uh, back then was like a revolution for hydrometallurgy, was something n totally new. Uh, and here in Canada, we had uh, a leader a work, uh, in, in the field, um, Gordon Ritchie. Gordon Ritchie, he was with CANMET, uh, Natural Resources Canada, in, uh, on Booth Street in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wrote to him, towards the end of my th thesis, I said, you know, I would like to come to, after my PhD, to work with you um, in, in your lab. And uh, he accepted. He, I received a visiting fellowship from the Governor of Canada. Uh, because back then, uh, yeah, I had just turned, uh, I got my permanent residence visa around that time. So I moved to Ottawa. And I worked as a postdoc for two years with uh, Dr. Ricci, uh, who really, he wrote a book about solid extraction. Uh, he, he was the founder of the Hydrometallurgy Journal. Everybody in with the world wants to publish in that journal. That was um, Gordon Ricci's creation. Uh, he created the Hydrometallurgy section of the Metallurgical Society. Mm -hmm. He created the annual meetings that we have as hydrometallurgists. So it was a very dynamic in the 70s and uh, early 80s when I finished uh, 81, my PhD was a very dynamic uh, uh, domain. I mean, uh, Canada and, and, and the research, the universities and government laboratories uh, were really number one in the world. We had a Professor Peters at UBC. We had companies like uh, Sherit. Uh, Gordon, um, Noranda, Inco, mm -hmm. Falcon Bridge, uh, uh, you know, the developing technologies. But the shared name, of course, was uh, a big uh, to me because in my PhD, not only I work with solvent extraction, but also with um, hydrogen reduction. It's a method to produce metal powders using hydrogen. And Sherrod Gordon has commercial uh, I mean, they were pioneers uh, in, in the late 50s uh, with this kind of technology. So Canada was a very uh, attractive, uh, uh, you know, country and place to do research in hydrometallurgy, uh, you know, with many, many, many leaders. Mm -hmm. good, good Which I'm afraid is not perhaps the case now. That's a different story. <laughs> yeah. Uh, would you like to elaborate on that? Because it's, it's not the first time it's been raised. Impact. Yeah, well, government, st start with government laboratories because we, we start with universities, right? Here I am, a professor of hydrometallurgy. If I retire tomorrow, who knows if I, there will be someone else continue teaching hydrometallurgy. This has not been 
uh, secured yet. Of course, there are other places like UBC that is doing very well. They, they have a critical mass. The industry has moved in thanks initially with, with Professor Peters, and then now Professor Tresiger and other mm -hmm. uh, members of the, of the group there, they are doing great, and there is a critical mass. Um, back then we had Professor Cooper at Queens, uh, we had Professor Habasi at, at Laval University, for example. Uh, but, you know, Laval does not have hydrometallurgy, it has mineral processing, but does not have really hydrometallurgy. Will McGill have hydrometallurgy? Queens now has a professor, a young professor in hydrometallurgy. UFT uh, has uh, uh, hydrometallurgy uh, since uh, the early 90s, Professor Papangelakis, who I'm proud to, to call myself his supervisor. He did his PhD right. with me. But, you know, uh, so there is definitely a strong presence at the university level, but apart from uh, UBC, there is no critical mass in other areas. So th there is always the element of risk if th th there will be continuation. That's the university situation. Now we come to government laboratories. CAMET is not there anymore. I mean, it is there. And actually I'm proud that another graduate of mine, Janice Zink, uh, a woman, uh, she is leading um, the, the, the metallurgy group and the environmental group at CAMET in Ottawa. Uh, but the, the reality is that it's not the climate of the 70s and the 80s. It's not. It's not uh, the, the, the climate of John Dutrezac or uh, Gordon Ritchie. You know, these people, these names were uh, known to everyone around the world that had to, that will read about hydrometallurgy. So government laboratories, there were provincial uh, government laboratories that do not exist in Ontario, in Quebec. Um, they do not exist anymore. So the government withdraws from research. Uh, we had companies, corporate. We had uh, here in Montreal, we're lucky. Noranda Technology Center was a flagship. I, I, I did for, thir uh, for 25 years, I was working with them. I, I owe so much the support I received. As, because as professor, if you are isolated in, in, in your lab or in your classroom, uh, you don't have uh, a lot of influence, a lot of... Uh, potential. You need that um, back and forth with industry to work. And so you need to get support from them, but also, you know, to, to train good students that they will hire and also work on projects of interest to them. So the companies, INCO, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Sheridan Park, uh, big laboratories, worldwide known, um, uh, and, and other companies. I mean, I mentioned Sherry before, Cominco, Falcon Bridge. But just in the Technology Center that I know so much, this, even they demolished, there was a modern uh, building, and they demolished even the building to build a condo or apartments. The, the Canadian leadership of um, Canadian co uh, corporations like Norada, uh, Inco, whatever, it's gone. There's no leadership. There's no ownership. Uh, no, if they exist, they're all um, they're all owned by outside companies now. Yes, like the Valet. No, it's Valet and Falcon Bridge. Now it's uh, it was Extrata. Now it's Glencore. Um, I mean, Canadian Electrolytic Zinc outside Montreal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have a couple of years with their present contract. Will uh, Extrata continue supporting them? or they will pull the plug. You know, the decisions are taken outside the country. There is no, as far as I'm concerned, strong leadership, national leadership, when it comes to matters of uh, R&D for the mineral metal sector. Maybe the mining, the, they, they create the Mining Innovation Council, but that stops in mining. But, 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 but we have to add value to our minerals, not just uh, uh, raw material, com you That's, know, commodity. I was going to say extraction. it's funny because they go hand in hand. I mean, mining and metallurgy. That 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 was the winning formula before. Like Inco had the mines, but also they had the exactly. smelters, and and they develop technologies, the carbonyl process, you know, um, and other companies to produce high purity nickel powder. Uh, you know, you you can use it even for. Uh, batteries and so on. Um, 
But there is no such vision anymore. There is no. The government is, is more or less out. The, the, there is no private corporate uh, leadership. But we have one winning uh, sector here, uh, engineering companies. Hatch. Hatch, yeah, Hatch. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to associate myself with, with Jerry Hatch. And, and I owe a lot to him because it was thanks to a gift that he gave to McGill University that I was hired in 1987. Otherwise, I would not have been a professor. I mentioned before about professors um, of hydrometallurgy. Without that private gift from uh, Jerry Hatch, I would not be here talking to you today. So Jerry Hatch went out, he started in the 50s with a company of five engineers and he built 10,000 uh, uh, person company, global engineering powerhouse. We have SNC Lavalin, we have BA, uh, uh, BAA, we have Medchem, we have um, um, many other engineering firms. That part of the industry is doing well and, and we still have uh, uh, a big name and uh, for our graduates to find jobs and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, the research side suffers. So do you think you had mentioned universities and government, so you had mentioned the government doesn't seem to push or try to develop um, R&D in general and also, but also create leaders like you had mentioned Dutrazak or, or or Fadi Abashi or yeah, any of these big Richie. names. Um, do you think it's also, so you had mentioned the government, but do you think it's also just an interesting, like it, in schools, are there less people who decide to take hydrometallurgy or, or specialized in, in metallurgy? That, that's, um, that's a myth. Uh, if, if you have um, uh, uh, professors teaching hydrometallurgy and doing research in hydrometallurgy, students will come to you especially when the projects are supported from industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and these graduates with a master's or PhD, or even with a bachelor's degree, they will find jobs, you know, meaningful jobs, good jobs, that they, they, they will make a contribution. But when uh, you see, you know, less and less um, from the industry side, therefore the, the, the students will not, uh, so interest. I know that there is a competition, like, I mean, in my department, I, I live this here, I'm the chair of the department now. Uh, we are materials engineer, we're not metallurgical engineering. We're unique, we start with mineral processing. The students l learn from minerals all the way to electronic materials and biomaterials, like, uh, you know, heat replacement uh, uh, materials, you know, n not just metals like titanium, but also um, materials like fluoroapatite or uh, artificial bone, uh, etc. All, all kind of, of research is, is going on. So a student obviously, he's overwhelmed now. Where uh, I'm going to meet actually the undergraduate students today at 5.30 uh, to hear their views about uh, our program and so on. But um, yeah, they're overwhelmed from mineral processing all the way to advanced materials. So, uh, yeah, the reality is that still more jobs exist in the traditional fields. You know, the mineral processing mm -hmm. uh, remains strong, um, but the metallurgical jobs, they're less and less. I mean, we don't have steel companies anymore. I mean, the Dofasco and Stelco, okay. etc. they're in, in, in uh, their other hands, or uh, uh, I Ipsco, whatever was the name of the company, Saskatchewan, Regina, now it's in Russian owners. Nothing against international ownership. It's a global uh, game. I mean, uh, uh, trade and so on. But a country should in reinvest some of the revenue, profits, whatever we, we generate into R&D and into training, HQP, we say, highly qualified personnel. Mm -hmm. People who will become leaders tomorrow and will generate wealth. Uh, so we need to, to, to invest more on the human, 
knowledge uh, capital. Uh, we, I, I don't know. Uh, right now, we're in a transition period. There is less research than necessary. Like the R and D spending by Canadian mining companies is down. Yeah. And they include usually as research exploration. Oh yeah. Trying to, to find new ore bodies, etc. Well this is not research. Of course, without the ore bodies you cannot have a mine. I agree with you. But research is to go beyond to optimize the process, to reduce the energy uh, that you use, to reduce the environmental uh, footprint, to, to make new products, add value, generate more jobs that will be exportable. People would like to buy you, you know, your product, not just your raw material, not just tonnage of coal and unprocessed oil or un unprocessed, I don't know, copper or, or whatever. Uh, anyway, that's yeah. that's a challenge. But yeah, for sure. Thanks. Um, so, so speaking of, of research and, and lab work, can you tell me a bit about your uh, your research? What maybe what uh, stands out throughout your career? What you're proudest of in hydrometallurgy, especially? Well, I'm proud of the people that they did their uh, uh, postgraduate degrees with me for masters and PhD. Um, many of them, they, they are successful in their careers, um, senior positions, uh, and so on. Um, so, number one, it's people. And people have to realize that, that universities are for uh, producing, you know, like NSERC, the Natural Science and Engineering says, says highly qualified people, people with qualifications. Mm -hmm. So that's our product, and, and I'm proud of the people who have worked with my, uh, with me over the years. We have done, uh, as far as I'm concerned, good work in the area of uh, different um, hydrometallurgical unit operations, uh, autoclave processing of ores and concentrates, uh, solvent extraction, and uh, precipitation crystallization processes. And um, I, ca I can mention our work on arsenic immobilization, stabilization, which relates to crystallization that started uh, 20, 25 years ago. And now it's a commercial reality uh, in Chile. And it was a PhD student of mine that um, persuaded his company, Codelco, the number one copper company in the world, to go that way. And, and, and I have to say something here about, you know, Canadian companies and, and, and the field. Um, it's thanks to Canadian companies that I did this research. Because to do research, you need to have master students, PhD students, who you have to pay them, to support them. The money comes from companies plus the government. So we get grants and we pay the students and they work on a project. So I was uh, fortunate to, to get support from Canadian companies and the Canadian government for that research. I will go to conferences, present this. People will have nice things to say, but always questionable. You know, they, they will question if this is practical, this way, uh, etc. This is on arsenic. The on arsenic, yeah, yeah, they work on arsenic for, for many years. Um, and um, it was only, uh, and, and, and even the Chileans, that they have a big problem with arsenic, back to 96, 97, they gave me a contract. So a postdoc of mine goes down to Chile, dance, he runs experiments, we demonstrate you can make scorodite, the particular form of stable arsenic that can solve the problem of pollution. But mm, I don't know if it works. They were skeptical. But 10 years later, a PhD graduate of mine from Chile, he was hired by the same company, and he was told, deal with the arsenic problem. So he did what he learned here, and eventually there was uh, a process that they, uh, they piloted and they installed, and, and, and it works. 
just the lesson is that uh, I was fortunate to get support from Canadian companies, but we don't have any application of this yet in Canada. I hope one day it will be. But, or something else. But, but the bottom line is that this was a very uh, rewarding work mm -hmm. uh, with the people that, that they did the work, uh, the companies that they helped, and eventually to see um, also in Japan there is an interest. I have been invited a few times. Uh, they have developed a variation of this corodite process there. Uh, in China they are interested. There um, are other countries. But uh, things are moving a little bit slowly because I, I have to say that when it comes to environmental technologies, the mining companies, they are not proactive. They are reactive always. Okay. It's only when, you know, they don't have a choice. Yeah. <laughs> Um, as a non-metallurgist, uh, could you could you tell me a bit more about the work on arsenic chemistry and, like, maybe in layman's terms or, or the and its environmental um, side to it? Or oh, how it works? You mean to tell you to okay. describe a little bit more yeah, more this process? Yeah, but yeah, in the process you worked on. Okay, so when um, you process, uh, let's say, copper concentrates or gold or that contains arsenic, that arsenic is mobilized, as we say. It's released. It's not anymore in a mineral solid form. So either will go into a, uh, an exhaust gas, if, it, if you use a furnace, and you collect it uh, as a dust, or will go into a wastewater stream, if it's a hydrometallurgical type of plant. So now you have two types of, of waste. One as dust, that's, you know, it's uh, arsenic trioxide, uh, it's the form of that um, dust, which was used as poison during the Roman times and during the Borgias uh, papacy, you know, I, if you had seen the, the series, the Borgias yeah. uh, uh, on um, TV, uh, that white powder that, you know, kills you and so on. Um, so you have uh, this type of either in a liquid form or in dust. The dust form, what they were doing, they will uh, stockpile in underground tunnels, for example, in a dry area, not coming in contact with water because immediately arsenic will go into water. And we have a bad legacy right now in Canada and the Yellowknife area Northwestern Territories. There was a gold mine and a, a smelter, a roster, uh, and they have 250,000 tons of this dust um, stored in underground tunnels. The company went bankrupt in about 15 years ago. Royal Oak, I think was the name. And who inherited all this mess? The federal government which means the Canadian citizens, to clean this uh, legacy waste. And uh, the government has a technical panel, a committee, experts. They, are, they, they looked in different options. But it's in, in such bad shape, those underground tunnels, that, that they cannot send workers to remove the dust out to process it. Uh, and, and they are talking more than $1 billion to rehabilitate and, and stabilize. So this is only one example of a, a waste form of arsenic that has been badly managed. Now, if this dust is accessible, I can take it uh, and process it in tanks with acid. Um, and uh, some addition of iron, and we make then from the arsenic uh, a synthetic mineral called scorodite. Okay. That's a, a compound that contains iron and arsenic and oxygen. And what can that be used for? Nothing. 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 Okay. It's just not... Uh... It, that's stable though. Okay, exactly. It's not like the arsenic trioxide, the oxide of arsenic, yeah. that's very soluble. Exactly. That one is stable. Okay. Now, when I say stable, don't take me wrong. Nothing is stable 100%. I mean, it's a, Earth is a dynamic system. Things change. I mean, um, 
just we want to make sure that the weathering of that mineral, the gradual release of arsenic will be below a threshold that will pose any risk. And we do all the studies and not us, hundreds of people, there are a lot of papers about the, the arsenic and th that uh, um, you can maintain very low concentration. It's funny because drinking water always mentions arsenic on, on the label and they say arsenic zero. Of course nobody will drink water with arsenic <laughs> but I don't know why they, they have always the arsenic <laughs> mentioned there. I don't know if you had paid attention. Um, so uh, th that's what we do. We, we can take that dust, we put an acid solution with some iron. Uh, it's like a chemical process. Uh, and we precipitate, we make that a powder, mm -hmm. particles of that synthetic mineral, which we then we can dispose in a, in a landfill which is properly engineered uh, with uh, the, there's a certain way to, to place um, a toxic waste. Although it's not any more hazardous and toxic like the arsenic oxide because it has very low solubility. But nevertheless, we want to be extra, yeah, extra. Uh, careful. So we're going to um, enclose in, in some kind of uh, insulating, um, uh, you know, uh, burial site. Mm -hmm. and, and if it comes in contact in the water, with if water, it comes in contact in water, then uh, some arsenic will be released that will be uh, below the, the level, uh, f for example, below 0.5 or 1 part per million, which when it's diluted in, in water, it, then it, it's, it's, yeah, y you go below to uh, the, 10, the 50 parts per billion uh, and so on. It, it, it's, you, you are safe. You, you don't have to worry. Okay. Um, but, uh, so that, that's one way uh, about the dust. Or uh, there are other forms, you, you, you may have an acid waste stream already containing arsenic. That's the situation, for example, in Chile. And uh, you, you, you can precipitate that arsenic again by, pro by controlling the chemistry um, of the solution, the acid and the iron and the arsenic and the temperature uh, to form that synthetic mineral. So the idea is let's return arsenic back to nature as a mineral. Because scorodite exists in nature. Therefore, that's the, the approach we okay. took. Uh, yeah. But, but, but there are more. I mean, we're doing research now. We have developed even uh, a second level of, uh, we have applied for patents, uh, a second level of uh, protection that this scorodite mineral material we're going to encapsulate into an inert matrix that will be totally uh, protective. So it will be another layer of protection. Uh, I, I mean, research keeps come, you know, bringing new ideas. New, but eventually, if, if research does, is not applied, but I, but I hope one day, you know, the, all these ideas will be useful. Yeah. So but in the process, we train people, right? Exactly. And these people learn, and they go, they work for companies, and they solve other problems that companies have. So they have that, that knowledge and that uh, you know, methodical approach and technical expertise and so on. So did they apply it in Chile? Yes, or, yes, yeah, 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 yeah it's okay. used since 2012. Okay, right on. Um, now here's a, a big question. and. Um, but again, no wrong answer to this. In your opinion, because of the, this project that we're doing, are there any events, people, inventions, disasters, anything whatsoever uh, that you believe must be mentioned when talking about the history of the natural resources in Canada? You caught me there, uh, William. Uh, and, and I mean, maybe nothing comes to mind, but it could be... Uh, could be one person specifically you think really changed metallurgy, or it could be, like I mentioned earlier, maybe a, f a disaster or a problem that, that needed to be solved and, and was or, or wasn't, but changed everybody's perspective uh, for the best afterwards. Well, I will mention Jerry Hatch, okay. 
because he was nice to me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but honestly, he saw the importance of um, being, you know, using, uh, w when we design a metallurgical complex, you know, a furnace, um, uh, etc., that we we use uh, sound engineering principles, and we and and um, we we design processes that they are efficient and so on. So it was like a paradigm shift. You know, himself he was a practicing consultant engineer. He built the company and so on. That 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 was. Um, that was big and still we benefit because, like I said, thousands of people are, are employed and uh, Canada is known for that. Um, well, th there was, uh, of course, uh, the acid um, rain problem mm -hmm. back in the 70s that we had uh, in Sudbury, right? With the, all the SO2 uh, releases to the, with, with the smelting, which was solved by, you know, having acid plants built, and so on. Um, I was just talking about that uh, the other day with a colleague, and how w growing up, when I first started going to school, and, and he's a bit older, and when he was going to school, mm. he would... Uh, no, no. Okay. We would both hear about acid rain and it being an issue, and we were actually wondering what happened. Is it is it completely solved, or...? Uh, it, um, well, it is. Yeah. It is. Uh, yeah, we, we, we don't have a problem anymore. Uh, I mean, uh, it was the Americans with the coal burning um, uh, power plants that they continue for some time after the Sudbury smelters and so on in Noranda in northern Quebec. Um, they installed acid plants that uh, they were a little bit late coming in, but uh, from what I understand, yeah, this has been solved. Okay. Th there is another problem, the acid mine drainage problem. Mm. Uh, and, and the industry changed the terminology to acid rock drainage. Again, not to give a bad uh, perspective mining. to mining. Okay. But basically what it is, it's, you know, when you excavate, you, you open a mine and you to take out the valuable ore, at the same time, you take out some waste rock that you dump it, um, you know, uh, nearby. And that rock, because it's iron sulfide, starts reacting with the elements and releasing acid, you know, the, the, so you have acid release and, and heavy metals and pollution, and there is a big program the MEND, uh, uh, which uh, I don't remember, mine, effluent, neutral discharge, something like this. And so the industry has worked a lot on that. Um, uh, f for me, you know, the, the technological aspects were of interest, like this solvent extraction, you know, Gordon Rich's work, uh, uh, because it was not only practical that they, they, they develop processes that uh, they are used worldwide, but also was the, the knowledge, the books, the scientific journal, the scientific meetings. But you, you said disaster. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, if they're... It might uh, not be it's just a, another angle to, uh, to think. You know, about. it's uh, this disasters is when you, you you hear in the news, you know, some uh, tailing spawned that uh, breaks uh, and 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 release the waste. And I and I was once uh, expert, uh, uh, and I had uh, visited uh, Guyana. Mm -hmm. That was a gold mine operated by a Canadian company that the tailings pond with a lot of cyanide. Um, uh, there was a bridge that was not properly, uh, there was a fight between, it was the engineering firm who built it or the operating company responsible. The bottom line is that all this cyanide laden waste dumped into the river 
Now, luckily, you know, there's a dilution effect, and cyanide does not last long. It's, uh, there's natural degradation. But those things give a very bad uh, publicity. Mm. And, but I think the, the company starts response to this thing. Just we need to be more proactive and, 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 and be more, you know, go for a better technologies and develop technology and commercialize technologies, not just look around and use a technology. No, L let's make also, let's innovate. Let's innovate. Yeah. Innovation is a problem in Canada, especially mm -hmm. in our field. Thank you. Um, I'll finish with a few uh, more s social questions. Um, one one that I find quite important about women, and uh, you've worked more, more in the academic world, but I mean, still, uh, I mean... So well, we see the graduates who yeah, eventually exactly. end up working for the company. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so this is where it starts. But throughout your career, um, have you, how present or absent have women been? So, I mean, it might be drastically different from back then to today, but if it is, isn't, um, how has that changed? You know, I come from Greece, and it's interesting that there, women are leaders in engineering. You know, th th there is more than 50% of the incoming class are women. Really? Huh? And here in North America, engineering is not ap appealing at all to, to female students. No, it's like 20% or something. Yeah, 20%. Yeah, maybe we, we get 25%. And, and, and we have a problem. It is true that we have a problem. We need to increase the number of women. I'm, uh, I'm proud to say that, you know, in general, I, I get more than 25% of my graduate students have been women in, in my group. Uh, and there are some women out there working that I remember how I recruited them, and now, you know, they, they, they work in big companies and so on, and how they started their career, you know, uncertain if they would be welcome or not. So we need to do more. We need to have more role models. By the way, yeah, uh, last uh, August, we had the Conference of Metallurgists in Toronto, and we had a symposium devoted to the memory of, of Lucy Rosato, oh, okay. with the yeah. women of yeah. impact. And of course we had, uh, uh, you know, Mary Wells, mm -hmm. the president yes. who organized that. That was a great initiative. And Indira Samara Zekera, who was one of the keynote speakers, uh, and, and other uh, accomplished women. Um, but on the hydrometallurgy side, we had organized a symposium called Lucy Rosato. Lucy Rosato uh, that I had the uh, good uh, fortune to work with her for 25 years. She was uh, my age, but she, unfortunately she, she passed away um, seven, eight years ago. Um, she arose to, to become CEO of a company. And she hired women. The, sup the technical superintendent being a woman. You know, a woman running the, the, the roster section, you know. Uh, and, and, and it's great. Uh, we need more. Mm. We need more, and we need maybe scholarships to some affirmative action. You know, or uh, NSERC at certain point in the past they had a program about women faculty awards. So a university to hire a woman uh, as professor, and the governor will pay for ten years part of the salary to be, you know more, uh, yeah, yeah we, we need to do that to, to attract, you know, the young uh, girls and, and, and boys, of course, I mean, science. In general, we have a problem attracting people to, 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 to science. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, our universities and, and, and engineering schools, my department for sure, we are uh, full house, you know, sold out, you know, from, yeah. from an admission point of view, because we attract international students. Yes. International yeah, students. Is very known for that. I mean, if you were at the convocation, two days ago we had convocation, the fall convocation, and you will see the faces of the graduates that are walking by and graduating, um, even medicine, engineering, and other uh, 
uh, you know, fields. Uh, it, it's, it's those who have an international connection. So we need to, to, to make science and engineering more attractive to young people, and but also reward them, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Re reward them, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with, with good, meaningful jobs, and so on. Of course, everything goes back, you know, what is the corporate leadership and the government vision and, and all this. Yeah. But but, but uh, we we need. Uh, and, and we need to work on, on things that they will um, mobilize their imagination. For example, myself, despite the fact that I'm late in my career, now I'm working on uh, um, energy projects, lithium-ion batteries for electrical cars and photovoltaic materials. And you say, how you go from hydrometallurgy to this? And that's what I'm doing. I show to my students that the processes used to make the materials for those advanced technologies, they, they have a lot of similarity with hydrometallurgical processes. Just, you know, we need to pay attention to some other properties and so on. I'm, I'm not saying it's straightforward, but things like that definitely attract attention of young people. They say, you know, oh, you know, you hear Elon Musk, you, you hear Tesla, the electric car, you know, um, can, can, can we create a little bit of buzz? Can, can we create yeah. a little bit of more uh, dynamic uh, innovation? We had BlackBerry, I mean, such a big success story, and, 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 and we didn't follow up, because of course you cannot expect only one. You need hundreds of, of, of small, medium-sized companies coming up with innovation, including the mineral metallurgical world. The new technologies will be created by those companies, and then the big companies w w will choose some of those technologies to implement and so on. Well, there is an interest more, uh, and that includes more women now, and that's the environmental sciences. The environmental, uh, yeah, green, you know. Yeah, that type of engineering. So, so who knows? Maybe that's going to really explode in the next few years. I mean, everybody loves, like you mentioned, Tesla and Elon Musk, right? A lot yeah. of people now see him as a... Yeah, he, can, look up to he, he, he cool. can walk on on, on water and yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, and so exactly. On. So so maybe there's a there's a door open there. Um, one last question before uh, before uh, last closing question, um, and that is of the if if you believe there's a disconnect between the natural resource world and um, the general population, if you believe there is one, and if so, why? Uh, I, I, I guess, I, I mean, we saw what happened with uh, the Keystone uh, XL pipeline. You know, usually the, the natural resources industry is in the news for bad reasons because of some environmental issue. It's unfortunate, it's, it's un unavoidable that, you know, when you have uh, uh, millions of tons of uh, material, you know, moved, to, to recover some valuable metal, etc., that you are going to cause some disturbance. But, uh, but, but so incidents where you know uh, accidents happen and, and publicity, you know, oil spill, whatever, and uh, you had birds or you had fish or something, that uh, m makes you know the, the public to be to to, to question you know, to, to be the disconnect. But on the other hand, our economy is based a lot on natural resources, jobs, and so on. So just we need to keep working to find that synergy, that uh, golden balance uh, to, to get the jobs, to get the money, the wealth out of, of our resources, while be leaders implementing green technologies and one going together with the other because I remember 10 years ago or, or 15 years ago you know with oil uh, development etc uh, you know or uh, CO2 etc sequestration was kind of you know uh, something that no, nobody was interested and then suddenly 
when the, the industry realized and the government that we need to do something, they invest a lot of money, but they were expecting within three, four years to have a technology that works. And now I hear, oh, despite all this investment with CO2 sequestration in Alberta or Saskatchewan, we haven't seen yet this really to make any impact on on how much CO2 we continue releasing glass, uh, global warming. Well, you need to work for 10, 15 years. Wh what you were doing 10 years ago, why you were not investing in research? You industry leaders and you uh, government leaders, it, it, we have a very narrow uh, view. So if we start realizing this with what we learn from our experience and Invest in our natural resources, but at the same time, invest in R&D that the environmental technologies will protect our water, our air, you know, our fish, whatever, our soil, the, our communities. It's a win-win situation. We cannot live without materials. You know, materials come from earth. I mean, we can we have synthetic materials, but still, there are the first ingredients come. You know, you cannot imagine them. They're all extracted. Yeah. yeah. But we have to, to return them back, you know, at the end, the life cycle of the material, the recycling, etc., that uh, uh, minimizes the impact. Inevitably, there will be impact. Mm -hmm. But we, we are smart. We can figure it out if, if we try to, you know, to think beyond the, the corporate and uh, narrow interest. Yeah. Uh, just a last question, and uh, that is, if you were speaking to someone much younger, like a student, for example, what would be the, the one piece of advice or life lesson you could give them, looking at their, uh, perhaps their future career? Um, pursue, you know, as career, something that you like. Y you must find an interest, even if it's not popular. Even if it's not, you know, the, the job of whatever does not look uh, around the corner. Don't think short. Just be um, honest, uh, hardworking, learn whatever you choose to learn, be good with that, uh, keep your eyes open, learn from others, and uh, ask the questions and, and you will succeed. I mean, it's, uh, I, I hate when I see people thinking, oh, uh, how much money I'm going to make when I finish with my bachelor's degree uh, when I'm 23 years old. Well, yeah, some of them, they will be very successful, and by the age of 30, they will have paid the mortgage of their house, etc. Okay, th that's great, but you must like what you do. If, if that's what you like, great. But... Uh, don't uh, short circuit y yourself and your dreams by by choosing to do something that you don't like because it's, it's it's you have a career in front of you. Like myself, I come to work and I like it. You know, I'm, I'm 64. We said at the beginning, mm -hmm. and I was asked to be chairman of the department. I said, but the, but the university at the same time gives a, an incentive program. It says, oh, people like me, I can work away with one uh, full year salary as uh, bonus. But on the other hand, they said, George, can you be the chairman of the department for, for the next three years? Why? Because I like what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And as long as I'm healthy, of course. Uh, so you must like what you do. If you don't like, today you came with him from Ottawa. Of course, you know, and etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, but But you must like what you do. If you don't like what you do, it's a long uh, life. If it's you. a long life, <laughs> yeah. and and it does have to be work uh, always related. But but somehow the work should bring satisfaction, and you, it starts with learning now, and ask the questions now that you are a student. Now that, um, and that's it. Well, thank you. Anything well, th like that? Thank you. Uh, I, I want to. Thank the Museum of uh, Science and uh, the Metsoc, my friend um, Sam Marcus yeah. <laughs> and, and, and all the other guys who, who uh, initiated this project. It's great. We, we need simply 
to bring this message to the young people like your last question and uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff um, you know so many innovative ideas and so many things to learn and, and to do uh, in mining, in materials, in, in metallurgical processes and, and so on. So uh, thank you and good luck. Thank you. Okay.